Okay, so I'll let those last few people trickle in. So welcome to the first ever RCCSS Chats. Uh, this is uh, going to be a live session, as you can tell on Zoom here, uh, but we're also going to be recording this, so it's gonna be placed on YouTube a little bit later on. Uh, throughout this interview, if you do have any questions, please type them in the comments section. And my kick-ass co-host, Dr. Melissa Corso, is going to be uh, the moderator and take in those questions, and we will get to some of them at the end. Uh, Mel, if you do find anything really cool or timely as we're going through this uh, section, feel free to chime in and interrupt uh, the, the interview as it's going. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so I would like to introduce our first guest, Dr. Scott Howitt. Howitt, I hope you don't mind. We had to keep the bio to just the highlights. I felt like if we went through the full thing, uh, we'd probably be taking up the whole call. So Dr. Howitt holds an honors baccalaureate degree in physical education from the University of Western Ontario and a master's degree in human health and nutritional sciences from the University of Guelph. He graduated from C CMCC and completed a two-year postgraduate residency in sports sciences, a three-year postgraduate program in rehabilitation sciences, and a two-year course in acupuncture. Dr. Howitt was a member of the core medical team for the 2015 Canadian Pan Am team and works with various amateur and professional sports teams, including the Canadian men's national soccer team. Dr. Howitt has a special interest in endurance athletes and coordinates the medical coverage for the Toronto Triathlon Festival and the Toronto Ultimate Club. He's a lecturer for undergraduate and post postgraduate sports medicine, rehabilitation, nutrition, and fitness courses. Dr. Howitt is, of course, also the president of the Royal College of Chiropractic Sports Sciences in Canada. He's on the National Advisory Committee of Exercise is Medicine Canada and the editorial board for the Journal of the Canadian Chiropractic Association. So please welcome Dr. Scott Howitt. So Howitt, congratulations on everything you've done. Uh, it's seriously, it's, a, it's a, a lot, but why do you do it all? Uh, okay, you're gonna start with the why. So you're yeah. like, uh, like you're like Simon Sinek here. Uh, yeah. I think you need the, a little of those glasses on, perhaps if you're gonna be Simon Sinek. <laughs> the why, right? Okay, so um, you know what? We did this for our clinic a few years ago, um, and we decided that our why was to, that we help people move better. Uh, that was as simple as it was for our clinic. Um, I think that still holds holds true today. I think that's what we're what we're still trying to do. And I suppose personally, I'm I'm still trying to do that too. Uh, I might expand upon that to say um, my why would be I'm trying to help people get to where they want to go. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I mean, from a sporting perspective. Uh, you know, if you want to run a marathon or climb a mountain, if uh, you know, working with Canada Soccer trying to, to help us get to the World Cup, um, if, uh, working on a research project, trying to contribute some cool ideas that might help push that along a bit better. Um, you know, I, I think I think I'm reasonably good at that kind of stuff. And I mean, that's the secret to being happy, I think. If, if you can find things that you like doing, and then you're reasonably good at doing uh, and keep doing those things, um, it's, it's easy to be happy. So yeah. my, my, I, I do it because I like it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, hurt that you get paid for it either. <laughs> um, but seriously, though, you've done a ton of schooling uh, to continue with this as well. Um, and it seems like you're always, uh, always learning. So like there must be some kind of deep down driver for you to, I don't know if it's you want to be at the top of the game or be one of the best that you can be. Um, but I feel like there's something deep down that's kind of driving this as well, because uh, you could be getting that degree and then uh, just kind of taking it easy and coasting. Um, Pad. <laughs> no, okay. ser ser so seriously, when I was uh, a resident, uh, I was a resident with Jason Padrakowski, um and Janice Drover. And, and then a year later, Cam Brody. And man, we were just trying to push each other and, and, and trying to not one up, but try to like, you know, Padge would present him with rounds one week and I had to go the next week. So I, I had to step up and 
uh, it's kind of like that, you know, scenario that all all boats float a little higher in a high tide kind of scenario, right? So, um, what drove me was the was the people um, around me, particularly in the residency program. And then, uh, we, you know, we started a clinic. And uh, I mean, what drives me every day right now is, uh, I mean, I work with. Andre Ospina and uh, Mike Shivers, like the door, the right door right next to me. And he's on the screen right now. I can see him, Mike Shivers. Um, I mean, we have conversations about patients and about uh, life and about sports and like stuff every single day. So uh, I don't know what drives me is, is, is the people on the screen. Yeah, I totally get that. I have to keep up with uh, Dr. Corso and uh, Dr. Savage as well. So it's a, uh... It's not easy to do. Totally got that. Um, as a chiropractic student, you were one of those people that I looked up to and, and I wanted to try to emulate my career after. I was just wondering if there was a person or maybe a course or something that uh, significantly changed your uh, the path of your career when you were a student or uh, early practitioner. I guess you got to some of that with the, the coworkers and people that you were around you, but maybe as more of a, a leader or someone that you kind of idolized. Um, I, you know, I just kind of mentioned those, those same people, um, I, again, but, um, I mean, when I was a student, uh, like in my second year, uh, ART was just kind of hitting. Um, and like, I, I consumed those courses as, as quickly as possible. Like by the time that I had graduated, uh, in 2000, uh, that's like 20 years ago exactly 20 years ago, actually. Um, I, I had taken all, all, every ART course possible. Um, and the guys that were, you know, obviously Mike Leahy, uh, but the guys that were like kind of at the, at the top of the game sports-wise at that moment in time were uh, Mark Scapatici and Mark Lindsay. Uh, and those are the guys that I uh, aspired to be. Um, you know, Padge and I would be like, who's Scap and who's Lindsay? Like we, we would like, fight for which guy was which but I mean that that's kind of uh probably where it all started and uh I don't know I, I to me it's just I you take every single course uh that you possibly can and um my my starting ground though was uh was definitely ART yeah right on. how long was it after you finished school that you actually started uh teaching ART as well um I think sometime during my residency, like, so, um, I, again, I graduated in 2000, um, started the residency that summer in 2000 with, with Padge and Janice. And, uh, I don't know, maybe 2002, 2003, I, I would have been like sort of just completing the residency, I think is, is probably when we would have at least started helping to instruct it. Cool. Uh, that leads pretty well into the next question there, um, that I had for you, which is, how do you integrate all of this new information? You've been someone who's continually taking courses and someone who is teaching different courses as well with ART, fascial distortion model, functional range systems. So how do you start to integrate all of this information into something that you can use in a practical sense in clinic? Uh, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's pretty tricky actually, um, or maybe it's not so tricky, but it, it's, I always viewed it as like, like how many tools do you have in your toolbox kind of scenario and the more tools, the better so that the person in front of you, um, if you're, if you're uh, tried and tested tool wasn't working, you reached in and, and, and grabbed another, but, um, you know what? I was, I would always look for ways to link things or, or to scaffold concepts together. Um, and, now that I'm thinking back to those resident days that you just uh, tweaked me on, um, like when we started in the residency program, we were doing rounds presentations on acetate, like, like the, the clear plastic paper and like markers and writing. Start and, to date yourself a bit. And I'm trying to remember there was someone who was a lefty. It was terrible. You could never see what they were writing. They covered the whole <laughs> thing. It was just ridiculous. But, um, and our first innovation was we brought PowerPoint to the residency program. And originally, the first couple of times Padge and I went, we, we were using um, PowerPoint, and then we would like photocopy it or like print it, and then make it onto the acetate. 
<laughs> so instead of having to write, we just had to like put the sheet on, like you were, as if you were moving slides. Uh, and then I don't know if it was Janice or Padge that actually threw down a, a real PowerPoint, uh, which was crazy. But changed the game. But those acetates, I remember um, thinking about um, acupuncture and thinking about the old, uh, you know, Travel sort of trigger point uh, maps, those, those pictures, and thinking about ART. And I took one of those old acetates and I was, I was trying, I put it on top of it and I was trying to like say, can I line up some of these acupuncture points? with the ART things that uh, Mike Leahy was talking about, with the trigger points that Travel was talking about. And in fact, there was more than a handful that lined up almost perfectly um, as a way to try to like scaffold those different concepts together, or at least uh, as, a, uh, as a map to maybe some of the places that you might wanna go to. Yeah, that actually, uh, I, not the same type of thing for my rounds, but I, I did something kind of similar looking at acupuncture where, uh, we were uh, checking up the acupuncture meridians with uh, like fascial slings and uh, intermuscular septum. And, and it really seems like the, those acupuncture meridians seem to uh, follow a lot of those uh, fascial patterns in our body. And then you kind of start to piece these things together. It's, it's cool when you make those moments. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I found like when I was, I mean, still, but as a young practitioner, I would take a course and then I'd try to use the tool that I had just learned on the weekend or whatever. And it was like, oh, this is, this is really difficult. Like, I don't, I don't know how to use these tools yet. And you kind of need a little bit of time to reflect on it. Uh, not only that, if you learn a, a new diagnosis or a new particular thing, uh, the following week in practice, everything you see seems to be that thing that you just learned. Yeah, um, absolutely. There's a name for that. I, I, it's not off the top of my head, but. <laughs> uh, another thing that, that uh, kind of ties in with this is um, like how the residency or how like keeping up with research really ties in for being able to take courses as well. And I think it, it really contributes towards that having that deeper understanding so that you can take what somebody is saying and, and say, okay, is this is this real? How does this fit into like my perception of reality? And I think you probably have a huge background of that staying up to date with research and, uh, and taking all these courses. Well, I see a couple of my current interns on here right now. And uh, we had this conversation uh, earlier today about uh, there was a paper that came out yesterday that said, um, you know, if you're, if you're tired, um, it's okay to now put your hands on your knees and bend forward. And that's actually, uh, you know, it, getting your tidal volume uh, back in and, and, and recovering, as opposed to the old way where track coaches would be like, uh, don't do that. You have to stand like, like this, right? Um, and we were laughing about it. And then we, I was like, but remember, um, new evidence doesn't tell us anything. It's the total body of evidence. So one interesting paper with 20 female soccer players with their hands on their knees is interesting. And then certainly confirms my bias that hands on your knees is fine. Uh, and if you were watching any of the last dance, Michael Jordan, look at how many times he's on his hands on his knees, right? Yeah. So if you're the best player, it's totally fine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um. To switch pace up here a little bit, you're someone who does a little bit of everything, whether it's teaching, your involvement with the RCCSS, in private practice, you uh, were a business owner. Um, how do you continue to do so many things at such a high level? Uh, well, thanks for the compliment. I'm not sure I'm at a <laughs> high level on, on quite all of those things. Um, I, I love doing those things. I, I'm passionate about doing those things, but I, I suppose, and, and a few people have reminded me this or pointed this out to me at, at different times. Um, I was gonna think of what the right word is. My wife uh, permits, allows, <laughs> and not encourages, I, I wouldn't say that, but she's okay with it. She understands that those things make me really happy. So obviously uh, I have two young girls and I couldn't do it without the support of my wife allowing me to do those things that she knows, you know, kind of get me jazzed up and make me happy. So, um, I, 
it, it's 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 hard it's hard actually when you have young kids i think when uh there's going to be a sweet spot in my career when uh my kids are teenagers and they won't mind that i'm away for uh you know they want years. they'll want you to be away yeah. at that point <laughs> yeah so i'm not there yet but yeah <laughs> Yeah, that support system is huge. I mean, it's that uh, that saying, it, it takes a village to build one person. Um, one thing, you are so busy. Why do you continue with teaching? Ooh, uh, I love it. Um, <laughs> it, uh, I mean, I get satisfaction out of what I do in my office. I get satisfaction out of working with athletes and, you know, covering stuff, but, um, there's few things that give me greater satisfaction than seeing the success of students. Uh, and I mean, maybe I'm getting old again. I have two daughters. Uh, I'm getting soft. I don't know, but, um, like seeing the success of, uh, you know, the, the number of students that I've worked with in the past that go on to do great things is, is actually really inspiring. Uh, it keeps me wanting to keep pushing to, to continue to learn more and to continue to be better myself. But, um, I mean, I, I look around this screen and I can, and I see like, you know, members of the CCO and I see, um, you know, other fellows and I see people working on their PhDs or about to work on their PhD. Uh, and that's awesome. Like it's, it's, I, I, I couldn't imagine not teaching to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. I know this is a pretty cool, uh, room to look around and see, uh, younger faces, older faces, uh, and kind of look at that lineage of, of how the torch has been passed along. And, and social media is awesome, right? So, I mean, I can look around and see, uh, you know, Kyle Simpson demonstrating some exercise with his patients, and I'm like, sweet, I'm going to take that one. Thank you, Kyle. And then I see <laughs> Craiger over doing something with the Chinese women's hockey team, and I'm like, cool. And so, uh, you know what? The, uh, part of it is like, it never seems like people really go away. Like I still know what people are doing and people still reach out and ask questions. And so I, I love teaching cause I have that many more friends yeah, and colleagues. Yeah. It's uh, social media has been great for that. I mean, even I found there's some people that either like weren't in my class or maybe I never really got like that much exposure to them when I was at school. And then now we're doing stuff on social media and it's like, Hey man, like, I really like you. Like, I, I like what I like all, all, all that you're about. Um, so there's a, a pretty cool experience with that. Um, we tried to get people to write earlier on in here, uh, if they were in your pod, but do you have any idea how many sports chiropractors or, uh, residents that you have had go through uh, St. John's? Um, I, I'm, I think, like around 20, I would say. I mean, I've been a clinician since 2003. Um, so on, on average, like, you know, one a year, sometimes there was two a year. I mean, there was one year where there was uh, four interns. Uh, Jacqueline Kissel at the time, Durante, uh, Pete Kissel, uh, Dave Schenkel, um, Kevin Sims were all uh, in the same well, two pods. And uh, that, you know, if you're going to ask me my favorite pod, I'm not going to tell you because I don't really, I, I, it's, hard, it's hard for me to say. Uh, I really, I really don't know. But I'll say one of my, one of the stories that I remember the most is those, those four. So the, the Kissels and uh, Sims and Shanko were all like best buddies. They always hung around together. And at the time I used to interview uh, people to come to, to St. John's to be interns. And um, Schenkel was the last of the four to go. And again, I knew they were all best buddies. Um, so Schenkel comes to the interview. Um, and I'm like, so uh, what's the question to number one? <laughs> and, and he looks at me and I was like, you have to know the questions. Like all your friends were here. If they didn't tell you the questions, either they're not really friends of yours or you're trying to pretend like this is silly. Like number one, go. And he said, well, you probably asked me. And then he said the question. And then he said the answer. I was like, that's right. 
okay, number two. And he's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I didn't ask him one single question. He gave me all of his answers <laughs> and he was awesome. And I was like, okay, you're in. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I guess I'll uh, be able to cross off that question about uh, who your favorite pot is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that we did, uh, both when I entered and when I left St. John's was the wing eating competition. Uh, yeah. Is that so basically the new pod has to go against the old pod who can eat the most amount of wings uh, and how it's just there to have a good time and eat a ton of wings himself. <laughs> so does this still exist? Um, yeah, I mean, in these COVID times, we're going to have to postpone that to the fall, I believe. But yeah. um, we've always made uh, a tradition of, um, you know, at that change of a time when, the, when one pod is done and the new pod of students or interns starts uh, that we have to go out. There has to be a social event. You have to be uh, the outgoing need to to give you a high five, and the incoming need to feel like they're part of the of, of the the team to follow, so to speak. Um, and, and there has to be some kind of competition. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> it, and it, you know, drinking beers probably wouldn't be would be frowned upon. So eating wings seems to be a reasonable substitute. <laughs> yeah so did you make any uh new traditions for the pod going out this uh, most recent time oh it's funny um so the pod going out had this tradition of of it, they would ice somebody um and i don't know what you, it, you know the smirnoff ice yeah uh, and i don't know how far beyond their pod it extended but for sure it was the thing in my pod uh where they would go out for for some event and if you walked away from the table, you'd come back and there'd be a, a you got ice. There's a smeared off ice in front of you and you have to grab it and chug it. Like that's, like that's what you have to do. So um, yesterday or well, Tuesday, yesterday, right? What day is it today? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's day right now. I, I never know really what day it is in these COVID times. So uh, Tuesday, I had to go to St. John's to get uh, the personal belongings of my last group of interns who are done now, but didn't have the opportunity to collect their stuff uh, from St. John's. Right. So I collected all of their things, uh, went to the church parking lot across the road, lined up, um, you know, a blood pressure cuff and shoes and an ice and your blood pressure cuff. And, uh, so everything was six feet apart. So when they came to collect their stuff, not only was their, their belongings sitting there, but I had an ice ready for everybody too. So that, that's the new tradition, I suppose. Nice, I'm, I'm glad you found it, some way to keep uh, that tradition alive. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna switch things up a little bit uh, and just ask some questions about the RCCSS. Um, what are some of the big projects that you guys are working on during your presidency? Well, I mean, I think we're, we're always working on um, research opportunities and research funding and trying to make sure that we have uh, that set up to help our uh, interns get through the program. Uh, obviously, we're, we've been working also on some education modules. I, I, I know a bunch of you have taken part in some of them. And I see Brad Muir on the, on the screen here who's doing an awesome job at, at pulling together. So what we thought was that in addition to our conferences, it's nice to have some uh, more manageable uh, one day type of uh, seminars and symposiums on some topics um, that help our uh, residents collect some of the um, educational requirements that are, that are needed to get through the program. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so there's that. Um, I mean, my thing that I, and not to say that this hasn't been done before, but what I felt like I wanted to actually uh, make a concerted effort to bring to the fellowship is more fellowship. And what I mean by that is like, uh, if you've been to our conferences in the last couple of years, like, I, like we need, we, we, we've always been social, but we intentionally now have a social event. So there's like, you know, at the end of the day, everyone gets a drink ticket. There's appetizers. We, we're just mingling and talking and some of the speakers stick around too. And, so I, I really wanted to have more uh, camaraderie and fellowship uh, amongst our group uh, at conferences. We've had a couple of different social events even on top of that. Um, and, you know, we continue to think about ways where we can uh, come together on, on fun things too. 
mean, even something like this is great to just to be able to see people's faces and, and realize you know that I'm part of this whole group. Yeah, and, I, and I'm hoping we don't screw this up tonight and that this is, because uh, I, I think this is a great initiative and I see a bunch of other people on, on my screen, at least, that could be uh, future uh, guests for you here, Chris. And yeah, also. and and you mentioned uh, with uh, Brad Muir and those uh, uh, modules and Alex Lee with the research, like those are both guys that we'll probably have on in the future to, to give a little bit more uh, information about both of those initiatives. Awesome. Um, one of the things with the RCCSS and, and becoming a sports chiropractor is, is for a lot of us that we want to be able to work uh, at a high level of sport. Um, and I know that's something that you've done in, in a few different uh, avenues uh, through the Pan Am Games and working with uh, the Canadian men's national soccer team. So what are some of those tips or advice on how do we get there? How do we start to get our young practitioners that experience to, to work at the top? Um, patience. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I almost want to laugh when I say it, but, um, it, it means some of these, sometimes you get opportunities that, that, that fall right at the right time. But to be honest with you, it's, it's really just remaining engaged, remaining involved. Um, and I, I mean, when I was a resident in 2002, I, I got to work with the uh, under 20 uh, men's soccer team uh, on a couple of trips. And I was like, here I go. Um, I didn't get to work with the men's national team again until 2017. <laughs> so um, not to say that I ever stopped working in soccer. I always was working in soccer. Um, I, I think the more that we are demonstrating um, how awesome of team players we are and how willing we are, uh, our group as a, as a sports chiropractic group, to do whatever it takes to help um, a, a team win or to help a team be successful, um, the more this is going to continue to happen. So, um, I mean, we roll up our sleeves we'll, and, and obviously we're competent and we have, we're highly skilled. But as much as anything, it's our uh, versatility and our willingness to do whatever it takes to, to push the cause forward. Yeah, right on. Okay, we're going to totally switch gears here into a new section, which is uh, rapid fire questions. So I'm going to ask you I have eight questions laid out here. And I just want you to kind of rhyme off some of the first things that come to your mind as uh, just to, for us to get a better idea of who uh, Scott Howard is. Okay. So first off, do you have any book or journal recommendations? Um, currently, I am reading Harry Potter 7 <laughs> to my uh, eight-year-old. And uh, it's, it's awesome. I, I very much like it. Uh, so I would recommend that. The book that I really um, am looking to read next uh, seriously is uh, Nick Winkleman's book on the language of coaching. So that's high on my list. That on Amazon. Yeah. The, the, um, the last book that I um, have just finished reading is Range by David Epstein, which is also a, an awesome book. But it's, it's, it's funny because I heard this quote Brett Bartholomew say just really recently that uh, leaders are readers, but they're also doers. So, um, I mean, seek out people and seek out experiences and books will find a way to find you, if, if that even makes sense. But uh, just kind of stuck out to me. Uh, Nick Winkleman and David Epstein, uh, both uh, previous presenters at the RCCSS conferences too. So Unreal, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, who is your favorite athlete? Um, okay, so growing, I, I'm going to say uh, one answer, but I don't know how many people are going to know him. So growing up, uh, it was Mike Bossy. So I grew up, it was always Islanders versus Oilers, and I was a huge Islanders fan, and I was totally a Mike Bossy guy. I, I shot right, so I had a white Titan stick, so that, that would make sense too. So Mike Bossy, but I will say my all-time favorite athlete, Michael Jordan. Uh, and if you haven't watched The Last Dance, you should. And uh, yeah. It's Jordan. Yeah. I mean, I remember, well, I don't know if I remember, but I remember seeing pictures <laughs> of when I was real young and having uh, the Bulls hat and little uh, Air Jordan shoes. Uh, but after watching that documentary, I'm, I'm fully on board. 
I did a road trip to Chicago in 98 to go see him because we thought it was going to be his last season. That's pretty cool. That'd be yeah. pretty cool experience. Uh, other than being a sports chiropractor, what was your coolest job? Ooh. I don't know if I had any really cool jobs. Um, my most impactful job, I planted trees for a summer. And that uh, very much improved my resiliency and my uh, hardiness. Because that was a brutal job. Uh, at least <laughs> That's the, summer, the answer I was expecting. At least the summer remember. that I was doing it. Yeah. Tree yeah. planting. Nice. Uh, where did you grow up? Kitchener. Cool. I thought you were from the Sioux. No, my wife's from the Sioux. Uh, okay. Come on, Chris. <laughs> you should know that. <laughs> I'm just getting to know him too. <laughs> when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, I wanted to be a baseball player in the summer and a hockey player in the winter. Do I would have been, after, oh, yeah. but the first ever hockey baseball, I think. <laughs> Larry Walker could have been, but what? Yeah. Uh, I know you're a big runner. What was your all-time favorite run? Oh, the best run is New York Marathon. No, no question. Uh, I mean, Boston's good, but New York. New York Marathon is, if you have a chance to do that, that's the race you want to do. There's so many fans everywhere. It's, that race is awesome. Uh, this is a little bit deeper. Who inspires you? Ooh. Um, athletes inspire me. Uh, actually, Al Alfonso Davies. Fonzie, have you seen what he's doing right now in Byron? He's lighting it up. So that, that kid's a stud. Um, you know what inspires me is, is um, coaches. Uh, coaches who give a, a, a pep talk or a speech. Like, you know, I remember the Titans kind of a, a talk. And again, um, it's almost like it's a bit uh, emotional. So, um, again, you know I work with Canada Soccer, but so John Herdman is unreal uh, at giving a speech. And it's like you hit on that, like, uh, Aristotle way of presenting a little touch of emotion where it, it's I can hear us like a pregame speech and I'm like give me a pair of boots and tell me what wall to run through and I'm good to, I, I want to play and I almost feel like I'm going to cry uh, I like I like I'm welling up a little bit I'm so almost emotional about it so sorry I, I have girls <laughs> no I get that I like <laughs> I'm a pretty stoic guy for the most part, but watching uh, Olympic opening ceremonies and those videos, like I'm just, just falling. Uh, last one here. What is left on your bucket list? Uh, I really want to get to an Olympics. Um, like, like medical on, you know, with whether it's team Canada or fingers crossed, um, uh, Canada competing. soccer, Canada soccer, we can qualify. So definitely want to get to an Olympics. Um, I think I, I, I mean, education is not a destination. It's a, it's a process. So I think I'm going to have to do a PhD. I, I do have a couple of questions that I want to answer. So uh, I think eventually a PhD might be in, in the works. I'll let Raheem and uh, Justin go first and then they can guide my way. I'll tell you how it's done. <laughs> I don't think you heard uh, Mel's little job there saying that uh, you were going to the Olympics competing. Oh, um, setting the bar low there. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, I am on a competitive curling team. I don't know that. Um, I, I still we're not still not good enough. But I mean, if there was a sport where I might have a chance, it, curling could be it. Yeah. Especially if you could get one of those dual citizens, citizenships and play for a country that's maybe not as, uh, not as hot hey, as Canada, it could work. That's I used to think that was my ticket, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to switch over to any audience questions. Has there been any that have come up yet, Mel? Um, I have one from a student uh, from out west, and he, his question was, um, what was your opinion on doing the residency at CMCC versus doing it like part-time or doing it externally um, away from Toronto because he's from out West? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I mean, when I finished at CMCC, first off, I went to CMCC because I wanted to do the residency program. Like, I, like full stop. Like that's the reason I went to CMCC in the first place. So, um, there was no other option um, at the time. 
there was a weekend program that had it was no longer running uh, when I got to CMCC. Uh, or it, it was running for one more year and then it was done. So it was really do the residency or there or or not. Um, I probably at that moment in time I might have even done my masters if if um, if there was no other option because I didn't really, I I kind of felt like I wanted to do a bit more school at that point. But um, I think the opportunity to to do the residency in conjunction with a masters in the place where you otherwise want to get your practice started is awesome uh, and something that I would wholeheartedly recommend and embrace um, if that setup works well. Okay, um, that's great. And um, we have another question. Sorry, I'm just kind of scrolling through here. Uh, have you read any research uh, recently that has challenged your clinical thought processes? Um, again, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of go back to that, the way that I answered that earlier in, in that it's the total body of evidence. So there's no like one paper that I read that, or that I can remember reading recently that has totally made me think differently. Uh, but it's an evolution, right? So it's like you, we keep on reading and that keeps influencing uh, our thought process. So, it, I mean, surely there's something, nothing comes totally to mind. Uh, I certainly I haven't read everything. So, I, I mean, not sure. Yeah, I think that's a hard question too, because a lot of, and I find this, the more you read, the more you see things over and over again and kind of how that fits into your thoughts and ideas already. So, um, at, at the, really yeah, I was going to say at the, at, the, at the same time, the more you read, the more you question everything. So yeah. <laughs> the, the, the greater your understanding becomes, the less certain you become in any of it. Well, so. yeah, yeah. You become very skeptical of what they're, what people are saying, right? So I'm not so entrenched on any of my positions that um, that reading a paper is going to tremendously sway me. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple jobs in here. Do you enjoy life as a disembodied head? I noticed that too, just a floating head. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It got way dark after being out here. So, sorry. Um, and then Roger had a question here. Uh, Shoot. Um, I got it there. Do you think Kipchoge breaking the two hour marathon is the greatest athletic feat in the last 20 years? Huh? That's a, that's a good one. Who's that from Roger? Yeah. yeah. The, the Menta. Um, it's impressive. I don't know. I, I mean, it, it was, um, it was so set up that, uh, it, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, with the uh, with the pacers, with the shoes, with the whole setup on the course, um, I, I think it's it's equally impressive. Just his uh, his best run, not under those circumstances. Yeah, cool. I think we're going to finish off with the final question here, which we basically have already answered, but just going to make sure that there's nothing else you want to add to this. So what are the next steps for Scott Howe? I think we've touched on that, hopefully getting to the Olympics and possibly doing a PhD someday. Uh, yeah, I think that sounds about right. I probably need to run that PhD thing a little bit more past my wife to get the thumbs up on it. But um, yeah. I think getting to the Olympics is going to be a real challenge, but um, man, I gotta, I gotta keep throwing my application into the games until I get to an Olympics for sure. Yeah. Well, well anything that you or Melissa that you'd like to add before we uh, close this off here? Uh, no, I, there are a couple more questions, but I think we're out of time. So um, maybe Howard, if you want to take a look and try and uh, send some quick answers that, but uh, otherwise I'm good. Okay, cool. Thank you for, uh, for everyone who came out for the first uh, one of these RCCSS chats. We will definitely be having more of them in the future, so stay tuned. Uh, we have a lot of great speakers coming through. Um, 
basically all the big people that you would expect from the RCCSS, and then hopefully we'll be expanding outside of the RCCSS too. Um, so thank you for coming out tonight, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. That was a lot of fun.